SJC 13007, Commonwealth versus Van Poonen to Shara. Okay, Attorney Reardon. Good morning, Your Honors. Theodore Reardon on behalf of the defendant, Van Poonen to Shara. The first uh, issue on appeal is the prosecutor's improper closing argument. As Your Honors know, this case concerns the deaths of an engaged couple. The defense at trial was that the defendant was having an affair with the female, Lena Bolanos, when the fiance, uh, Mr. Fields, walked in. In closing argument, the prosecutor said to the jury that this couple is, quote, now engaged for eternity. Lena will forever be Richard's fiance, but never his bride. This was an improper argument that was to an appeal to the jury's sympathy. There was no legitimate reason to make this argument. The Commonwealth says that this argument was made to rebut the defendant's contention that there was an affair. Now, if the Commonwealth wanted to illuminate the jury with the facts of the fields bolanis relationship, showing how strong that was, and that the claim of an affair was not true, that would have been fine. Well, counsel, a degree of hyperbole is permitted, a degree of rhetorical flourish is permitted, and comparing this to the evidence in the case, can you situate that comment in the context of the entire case and tell me how, is it objected to? Uh, this was not objected to. So tell me how it creates a substantial likelihood of a miscarriage of justice in light of all the evidence. Well, um, it, it, one thing I'd like to draw attention to is a case cited by the Commonwealth with the Alamany case, where the court found that it was improper for the prosecutor to say that the decedent will never walk down the aisle with her dad. And uh, this is along that idea, that being a bride is such a special moment. I understand, but it's, it's, you still, it's still just a comment, and we have to put it in the context, since it's not objective, to, of the evidence. I understand it's a big deal being you know, for some people, but just put it in the evidence. What, what, what's the evidence again in this case that tells us that didn't mat that mattered? The, well, it, it has to do with whether or not you would believe the defendant's contention that um, he was having an affair and that if you believe the defendant's argument. Testify? He did not testify. What evidence was put on of the affair? Uh, the defendant was uh, interrogated by the police and that interrogation was played for the jury. Um, and so, if the jury were to believe the defendant's um, version of events, that he was having an affair and that uh, the fiancé walked in, well, that would be a not guilty verdict for the defendant. Um, so it's... So you think that closing argument comment shifted the whole trial? Oh, absolutely. It's, it was extremely potent, yes. In, in light of the time, time span and the 911 calls and the, uh, all of that, well, and it, the way you got in the building. There was, Your Honor, undoubtedly, there was a substantial amount of evidence against the defendant, mm -hmm. but the whole defense to the case was that there was an affair, and this went to the, right to that, uh, that essential uh, issue. And um, if, if, if the defendant's um, contentions about what this was all about, that this was an affair, is uh, uh, believed by the jury, he would get a not guilty. Uh, if, if and you think that comment kept them from doing that? I do, yes, yes. Okay. Can and I, it, wasn't there something written on the wall of the penthouse? Yes. Something, a, a reference to, he killed my wife. Yes. Um, I'm wondering why, given that evidence, it was unfair um, in your estimation to make this statement about the, um, you know, forever his fiance, because there was sort of a contrast between what was written on the wall, my wife, versus um, their engagement? So the defendant's contention was that, that re the order was that um, Fields uh, murdered Bolanos, and then the defendant was defending himself from Fields and um, was defending himself when he killed Fields. Um, the contention at trial was that when uh, the wording, he killed my wife, it was the defendant referring to Fields killing Bolanos, and the counsel's argument at trial was that whether this was real or not, this was the defendant's perception that he was married or had a relationship with Bolanos. If there's no further questions on that, I'll move on to the second argument. 
The second argument, Your Honor, addresses the uh, jury charge on the extreme atrocity or cruelty theory, and in particular, the extreme atrocity element. There's a, a few different uh, sub-arguments to, to that, but the first one I want to address is um, the defendant's request uh, that the jury be charged that the Commonwealth needed to prove at least one of the Kunin factors, and that that burden was beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, instead, the jury was given the standard charge you cannot make a finding of extreme atrocity or cruelty unless it is based on one or more of the factors I just listed. The Commonwealth's response to this is, well, how many times does the jury need to be told about the Commonwealth's burden? But the fact is that the instruction that's given is an instruction that the Commonwealth has a burden to prove the elements of the crime. The Kooning factors are not elements, they're factors. And um, by not instructing the jury that the Commonwealth has not only a burden to prove the elements, but one of these factors, then uh, the, the, it's not properly stating the uh, Commonwealth's burden on this case, and that they should be instructed in particular that it's to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, so the, the, the instruction as given right now does not articulate that this non-element, a factor, needs to be proven by the Commonwealth. The second um, issue is um, on the third sentence of the uh, extreme atrocity or cruelty uh, element. Uh, it currently talks about the defendant's actions and about whether or not the defendant's actions, um, you can look at the defendant's actions to see whether or not there was extreme atrocity or cruelty. Um, I cited the Berry and Riley cases where there were concurrences which suggested that the court should um, not just focus on the defendant's actions, but also talk about the defendant's we, intent. We, we haven't adopted Barry and Riley, and we've had the opportunity to do so, correct? Uh, the, the court did talk about C Castillo, not, they talked about this, but not directly on addressing these two cases, but yes, they did talk about that, and I'm urging the court. You're asking us, it, it was preserved, but you're asking us to change the law on yes. these instructions. Yes, yes. Um, and so, uh, if there are no further questions on this matter, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. Attorney Shuri. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court, Benjamin Shorey on behalf of the Commonwealth, uh, addressing this first first argument uh, relating to the Commonwealth's closing argument. As I uh, explained in my brief, the the point from the prosecutor was proper for three independent reasons. I won't go into those details again, but I think it was uh, uh, decidedly proper um, on any one of those grounds. Uh, I will, the defendant has addressed Alimany as, as a comparable case, so I will uh, briefly address that. I think it's distinguishable uh, on, on a couple of points. Uh, first, there was no evidence that the, the, the the victim in that case was not engaged. She wasn't to be married. She didn't, and there's no evidence in the case about that. It was simply, the closing argument there was simply a reference to this abstract, positive life experience that this victim would never get to experience. Unlike that, the engagement of the couple here who were killed together in their own apartment, uh, where the victim hid her engagement ring from the, the defendant, uh, was was central, as the defendant has just said in his oral argument, uh, where the, the claim of an affair was central to the defendant's defense, the, the engagement uh, also was central. Um, it's also distinguishable in the sense that, that uh, or, or the defendant can't benefit from Alamein, because in that case, this court found that there was no, no substantial likelihood of a miscarriage of justice. On the, uh, if the court has no other questions on, on that point, uh, I, I think I would rest my brief for, for the arguments laid out there. As to the other two claims, I'll address them together if I might briefly because I think I've detailed the Commonwealth's response there in some depth as well. The defendant's claim essentially is that the, the, uh, the judge abused his discretion in, giving, in, in following this court. Uh, that, can't be, that can't be correct. The, 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 the judge was not at liberty to just ignore this court's model instruction, as this court has repeatedly said, uh, advised that the trial judges we, follow we, that. We, we've, we've reversed judges who unfortunately follow the model instructions. <laughs> there have been... I know Judge Fishman was the victim of that in, in a case, and some there, other people have been. So that's not... That, that doesn't seal it for you. Just well, it doesn't... I mean, if, if the model instructions doesn't mean 
that a defense attorney raises an issue and we frankly change our mind. And as long as we're talking about names, Judge White had never got reversed on a jury instruction in a murder case and didn't follow them. I think the, uh, yes, the abuse of discretion is, is a, an instruction being legally incorrect. Right. So it so is we possible. Have to look, I mean, it's, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it's probably a good idea to follow our instructions. It's not a, not a good idea. It's, it's, but, you know, the fact that the, the model instructions are there and a judge follows them, that doesn't insulate the judge from reversal, unfortunately, for a trial judge. Uh, uh, in, in the rare circumstances, very rare circumstances, where this court has found that it, it uh, advised something that was legally incorrect, of course, that you know, the defendant isn't just, uh, you know, doesn't have no remedy for that. Um, but that's not the case here, right? The, the, the uh, Castillo has followed up the, the model instruction that was applied here and explained it and applied that prospectively only uh, of course, there's room for this court to improve instructions uh, that can be improved upon without finding that they were legally incorrect before. But more importantly on both of these issues, addressing the extreme atrocity uh, instructions, uh, the, the, as the court found in Fernandez where the defendant was, was convicted on, on a first degree murder on multiple theories, there's really no reason for the court to reach it, reach it at all. The, conviction, the defendant's conviction stands uh, as to first degree murder regardless. Um, if the court has no no question, that because of the premeditation conviction and felony murder, and felony murder, both yeah. both were uh, were based for the conviction here. Really? And, and you have sufficient evidence, you say, under Castillo anyway, on atrocity cruelty. Oh, I think I think this is an overwhelming case under any standard this court has ever articulated for extreme atrocity or cruelty, where the the victims were kept together in their apartment for hours being tormented by the defendant. The, the, the atrocious nature of this crime is, is abundantly clear. Um, for that reason, I think there's absolutely no basis for the defendant's 33 uh, uh, claim here. Um, I would just point, I'm not going to the details of the atrocity of this crime again, I'd just point um, to, uh, the, the many hours the defendant took to, to plan and carry out this plan uh, of packing a backpack full of instruments of torture, taking the time to travel to the scene, getting inside, uh, waiting outside for several hours before going inside, picking his time carefully, ultimately going inside, and again, taking hours to carry out the brutal, uh, heinous crime here. I, guess I, I do have one question. Do you think if you take a look at whether, uh, the, the jury instructions as a whole on extreme atrocity or cruelty, that uh, it's clear uh, on those instructions that um, the Canine factor has to exist beyond a reasonable doubt? A, a, um, yes, I think, it's, I think that's a, the, the instruction as given and the instruction under Castillo both tell the jurors you must find one of these factors, and the and the Commonwealth's burden is clearly stated in in both of those instructions as well. So that's I think that's clear, um, and uh, but it it uh, in terms of how the individual jurors parse which factor is at play, that does not have to be unanimous and and shouldn't I mean, be. Correct. Why would it have to be if if twelve jurors think that the murder was committed with extreme atrocity or cruelty? Why would the verdict be not guilty because they disagree on which factor? Correct, and it, it makes no sense. And I would point out to Justice Lowy even it, uh, that there's room for this court to clarify that even an individual juror doesn't have to find which, you know, uh, for instance, uh, tampering with, with the victim's body or their clothing, um, um, pouring items all over these bodies, uh, uh, could be, I mean, undoubtedly goes to extreme atrocity or cruelty. But even if a juror had uh, a, a reasonable doubt as to whether that happened before death or afterward, it would go to it would go to the extreme atrocity or cruelty. Um, but it, but it might be a different factor in each case. So I think for it would make no sense for for jurors to have to um, unanimously agree on sp the specific factor at issue. If there are no further questions, I would rest on my brief.